It's my great pleasure and honor to be the one to be able to welcome you to the sixth annual JEIC Jewish Education Innovation Challenge uh, Innovators Retreat. First of all, my name is Todd Sukal, and I'm the executive director of the Mayberg Foundation. Hi there. <laughs> oh, that felt good. Keep it coming. Yeah. Anytime you want to do that, <laughs> anytime you want to do that over the next 25 hours, that's good. Okay. Um, first of all, as most of you know, the Mayberg Foundation is dedicated to the proliferation of Jewish wisdom and values in the contemporary world. And uh, it's really a pleasure to have with us here the trustees and founders of the foundation, Lewis and Manette Mayberg. <laughs> I'd, I really appreciate that, because if you cheered louder for me than them, I'd really be in trouble. OK, all right. Um, JEIC. <laughs> OK, JEIC has dedicated itself to uh, really disrupting complacency, and, and really, especially though, I have to say, finding some of the best and bright, brightest Jewish educators, most innovative, most thoughtful, most emotionally connected, most intelligent, and emotionally intelligent educators in North America. And I'm looking around the room right now, and I am just blown away by who's here. Uh, I am glad that I'm not an educator although I've learned an awful lot from you over the years. I think if I was an educator, if I were an educator, and I looked around this room, I would be even more nervous and shaky than I am. So really, just so, so happy that each of you are here. Um, you bring so much to the conversation, conversation that we're about to have. Um, first of all, I, want, I do want to introduce a couple of people. Rabbi Shmuel Feld, the founding director of JIC. And boy, oh boy, for the first time ever, I get to publicly introduce the managing director of JEIC, Sharon Freundel. Okay, tonight, we are going to look at the Jewish day school ecosystem. We're going to have a chance to hear a, a simulation from some hypothetical, maybe not so hypothetical situations. And to kick us off on that, wait a second, wait, there's more. Oh, I'm in trouble. Thank you. Um, is going to be someone we're just so incredibly proud and pleased to be associated with, Dr. Erica Brown. <laughs> Dr. Brown is an associate professor, we're so pleased to say, at the George Washington University's Graduate School of Education and Human Development. That is true in great part because she is the director of its Mayberg Center for Jewish Education and Leadership. And I do want to say, hot, there are a couple of things hot off the presses today, uh, today and tomorrow, uh, but one of them is that uh, the university has just approved the master's program in Jewish education, which Erica and her colleagues have designed. Okay. She also consults for nonprofits, as many of you know, and serves as a community scholar for the Jewish Center in Manhattan, and has previously served as scholar in residence for the Jewish Federation here in Washington, DC, and uh, where she directed its leadership institute, and has also held a similar position at Combined Jewish Philanthropies in Boston, where, which is very well represented here, I'm happy to say, okay. Um, she also was a Jerusalem fellow, is a faculty member of the Wexner Foundation, an Avi Chai Fellow, and a recipient of the Covenant Award in 2009, and also an award from the Hornstein Jewish Professional Leadership Program at Brandeis. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, not only is she the uh, author of, what are we up to, 11, 12? She, author of many books, uh, she is really somebody I have uh, come to, to know and learn from and really admire and respect. And so with that, I hand the program over to you. Here with a lot of old friends and hopefully a lot of new friends. Um, we have an opportunity in the next 24 hours 
to create a really sacred, elevated space to talk about Jewish education, to talk about it safely, but to talk about it authentically and openly. And I want to start with a quote from Martin Buber's I and Thou. We can be redeemed only to the extent to which we see ourselves. We're going to uh, engage in a simulation soon and um, watch what happens when various stakeholders in schools want things and there's tension. How many of you would say on a daily basis you experience tension in an educational setting? By a show of hands. Not all of you being honest, but OK, good. Um, we mean well. We want to assume positive intent. We assume that wherever you're coming from, you are working. As Pierre Kiavot says in Hey Yud Zion, as a machlok at l'shem shemaim, an argument for the sake of heaven. So I've really been thinking a lot about what this expression means. We know, we think we know what it means. A machlok at l'shem shemaim means that we all have the best of intentions, and those kind of machlokot endure. Now, what does that mean? They endure. They actually don't go away. They don't go away. You might think, oh, well, if it's a machlok at l'shem shemaim, we solve it. But maybe, actually, an argument for the sake of heaven is something that doesn't have a resolution, but has some really interesting and important stakeholders and, and positions behind it. And we get to Shemaim, we touch transcendence, when we're able to go outside of ourselves and value what that other person says, can see it fully, and recognize it without the need to resolve everything. Right? Erickson's um, the highest stage of adult maturity is when people can hold contradiction together without collapsing. Right? That we can hold these things together. And of course, we know that because we're Talmud students. And if you study Talmud regularly, you'll find a teku every few pages, chapters. Right? We say, we don't have a resolution to this. No one gets anxious about not having a resolution. You think that everyone, what do you mean I need an answer? Well, maybe you don't need an answer. Maybe we say Eliyahu's going to resolve this, which really means we're not sure he's coming. I mean, I invited him to the Pesach Seder. Um, I left my seat open. The last time I went to a bris, he was also not there, but he was invited. So the fact is, on some level, there's an understanding that there's a sacred place for ambiguity and for doubt, as long as we can bring our opinions fully to the table in an atmosphere of respect. That's not so easy. So I want to look at a, uh, and I'm going to invite you, I never do this. This is my first experience of inviting you to take out your phones. Uh, so for those of you who learn with me, you know that you have to put your cell phone off the table. But if you go on your app, you'll look at some of the sources we have today, because we're going to study them a little bit together. I'm going to be on page three. Anyone want to give some app instructions if anyone is? Uh... What? What's the Wi-Fi? Retreat, retreat 2018, all lowercase. Retweet, re, retreat 2018. Although it is retreated. All right, so I'm going to start with a quote. Again, another quote with, um, by Martin Buber in the middle of page three. When I confront a human being as my thou and speak the basic word I thou to him, then he is no thing among things, nor does he consist of things. He's no longer he or she, a dot in a world grid of space and time, nor a condition to be experienced and described, a loose bundle of named qualities, neighborless and seamless. He is thou and fills the firmament, not as if there were nothing but he, but everything else lives in his light. In other words, we get to a point where we let go of objectifying someone and seeing someone as instrumental to what we need, and that the relationship becomes then transactional, that a machlok at l'shem shemaim is, is you're able to see someone else in the true depth of their humanity and respect that. That's pretty different than the argument culture we have been busy creating in this country. So I'd like you to turn with me to actually an important Washingtonian, Deborah Tannen. She is a linguist at Georgetown University, and she wrote a book called The Argument Culture. So we're on page one of your sources. Thoughts on our argument culture? Everyone have it? Yeah? You're working on it. OK. When you go to the menu, stage one Wednesday, stage one Wednesday night. Stage one Wednesday night material. Wednesday night material. OK. Torah, source, 
There we go. Okay. So Deborah Tannen says, describes, that argument cultures really aren't so much a machlok et l'shem shemaim today. Shh. The argument culture urges us to approach the world and the people in it in an adversarial frame of mind. It rests on the assumption that opposition is the best way to get anything done, the best way to discuss an idea to set up a debate. The best way to cover news is to find spokespeople who express the most extreme, polarized views and present them as both sides. This is, by the way, is not a recent book. All right, so I just want to put this in perspective. The best way to settle disputes is litigation that pits one party against the other. The best way to begin an essay is to attack someone, and the best way to show you're really thinking is to criticize. Certainly true in the university community. So the best way to show you're thinking is to criticize. Now, that's not the machloket l'shem shamayim that we assume is kind of boober-esque. And so what I wanted to do is to take a look at a few things with you. There's a statement of the Talmud that even though Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai fought voraciously, vehemently against each other's views, their families married into each other. Anyone want to talk about that? Why that's significant? You're taking really strong sides against each other, but you're making sure that your children marry each other. I don't know about your machatanim. <laughs> it's not personal. Right? In other words, the, the idea is this does not need to get to level of personal attack. Now, all of us know that when you have a lot of stakeholders and they're coming from different places, there's your parent community, there's your, there's your administrative community, there's your teacher community, there's your student community. There's a lot of egos to manage. And it gets personal very, very quickly. And it's super hard to get people to actually focus on the principle of the thing without creating a context. You know why he said that, she said that? Because this is what happened because of that person's childhood. Um, and it was whatever it is, we're not actually able to distinguish what the argument is from the space, from the container where the argument comes from. And actually, we have this interesting pasuk in a verse in Zechariah. If you look at page one, the view from Jewish texts, va'emet va'shalom ehavu. That if we could get to this place of great intensity and light, truth and peace would love each other. Truth and peace generally are not good lovers. They're not good lovers. And we've got plenty of fine literature on this. M M Herman Melville's Billy Budd or Les Miserables, Ray Jean Valjean, is there people who say truth at any price. And the other people who say peace at any price. And so a lot of us now spend a lot of time in school communities Shalom Bayit means I need to give up what I believe in, compromise what I believe in, in order to make space for you. Why would I do that in a school community? Why would I sublimate my view to make sure that you, as a stakeholder, can hold yours? What? Sake of community? Teaching the children? So things can move forward? Right? You get to a certain point and you said, we are so stuck that if I don't compromise my own view, we can't move forward. Yeah, Lisa. Enrollment? You're not what? I might not be that committed, actually, and I become self-censoring as a result. I, I minimize my own view. Other things. The front rows are doing well. <laughs> right, so there might be lots of complicating factors, and another point is valid. You don't want to lose donor money. So I thought that was going to be number one answer. So I'm proud of you guys. It took a while to get there. But there are serious financial consequences of certain arguments. And we might actually say, as a result of that, we're minimizing our view and we're, and, and, and we're actually paving the way for something where our integrity in some way feels compromised. But we're willing to do it for the sake of the enterprise of Jewish education. Um, and, and this is an interesting, and as we'll see acted out on stage, attention that's real. So, I'd like to ask you, just for a few moments, to look at perhaps one of our most famous arguments about truth-telling. If you look at page two, you'll see a number of psukim from Sefer Shemot and Vayikra that says, stay away from untruths. Lo tisa shemash shav, take off my glasses, don't utter a false report. Next one, midever sheker tirchak, midever sheker tirchak, stay away from falsehoods. Lo tasu avel b'mishpat, lo tisa p'nei dal, 
don't actually give someone favor simply because of who they are or their standing in the world. Don't do it. It's not a good idea. Then we get to the real test of whether this works. So turn to page three, the top of page three, the famous argument in Ketubot, Ketzad Marakdim, Lifnei Akala. I'd like you to turn to the person next to you, simply read it, and answer the text questions. What is to be gained by telling an ugly bride she's beautiful? What is to be lost, and what would you do? Go. Helping people find their books. I, yeah. How many minutes do we have? Now they talk. He's looking it up right now. Okay. How many? When do you want me to end? We're not in terrible shape. I mean, we're in pretty decent shape. Okay, you had a few minutes. Shh. You had a few minutes to prepare for your next wedding. Um, so, what do you gain by telling a, an ugly bride she's beautiful? What do you gain, Arnie? Shh. Shh. Okay. All right, so when you tell her she's beautiful, you're helping her find the beauty within herself and be fully present in an experience where she's really center stage. Ronit? Okay. Okay, so that's beautiful right there in the same row. Um, the idea that you're telling a bride she's beautiful for her sake versus telling her she's beautiful for your sake so that you begin to see her in a different way and realize perhaps the limitations of your perspective, that you weren't fully able to see her for who she was. Yeah, I notice the women are answering this. Men, it's good you're staying quiet. It's probably better. Yeah. Right? No, if you do see her as beautiful, then, then you're saying it. Correct. So what are the objective, what are the objective aspects of what beauty is? Yeah. Nice and loud. Okay, so we all thank you. You are a lovely student joining us. Your name is? Jesse, thanks for coming. Um, so Jesse says, well, you know, we're all created B'Tselem, we're all created in the image of God. And so as we're all created in the image of God, there are these pieces of beauty that, that we need to redeem. I actually want to share a Hasidic story with you that, um, that um, Art Green uh, mentions in his uh, book, Eyes Made for Wonder. He talks about a Rav Nachman, not the famous Rav Nachman, the other Rav Nachman. And the other Rav Nachman happened to find the good and beauty in people. In fact, the way that he did it is he saw God in every face. And the way it manifests itself is that when he looked at you, he saw yud He vav He. He saw the holy letters of God across your face, and then he was able to see whatever it was that you were bringing to him had that framing. Those were the rose-colored glasses by which he saw you. He wasn't really successful in the rabbinate, and he went into the world of business. And he noticed that after a while, it was a different occupation, and it was a struggle for him to see yud He vav He, the name of God, in people's faces. He saw cheating, he saw lying, he saw compromising, and he noticed that it changed the way that he looked at others. So he hired a shamash, he hired an assistant, and the assistant had one responsibility. He said, your job is every time I meet another human being, remind me to see God's name in that person's face. Now imagine hiring that kind of personal assistant. And imagine what that might do for machloket l'shem shamayim, 
for keeping arguments in a place where there's genuine transcendence. There's something that you feel, the holy place that you've hit in the actual act of argumentation because you gave, you created a platform for everyone to bring some piece of themselves and pick up those pieces of radiant light and do something magical with them. So Rav Nachman actually was able to retrieve his own personal best self by putting someone next to him to remind him that he's got to see that in all of his stakeholders, as do we. Our project today, and we understand, by the way, the Kate Submaraktim Lifna Akala, we understand the rabbis are going, really, could you say it if it's not true? And there's a substantial body of literature to support the fact that maybe it's best not to say anything at all rather than to say something that's not true. And then it's actually digging deep and saying, let me actually think if I can interrogate my own notions of beauty, because maybe there'll be a lot to be gained and much to be lost if I can't. So right now, we're going to transition. I'm going to invite Rabbi Feld and our participants up to the stage to watch a simulation, which we hope will bring out some of the tensions we deal regularly with in, as, as, as stakeholders in school communities. And how could we potentially frame this in a way where more is gained than lost, where people can stay true to the integrity of their opinions, and where emet and shalom, where truth and peace can really coexist in a place of beauty. Good evening, everyone. Um, let's have a seat. We're, what we're going to do is we're going to run a, a the same way that everyone else has ways of taking risks in the classroom. One of the ways that the Mayberg Foundation and JIC take risks in how we run conferences and how we think about how we want to do things. So, in order to sort of like get that idea and understand how we're going to work it, what I had was if you uh, you can see in the app that there's a scenario that we are setting up and that we're going to try to simulate here. So I'm going to be walking around being a little bit of the narrator, trying to provoke people a little bit. But primarily what we want to talk you're welcome. But prim primarily what we want to talk about is the decision-making processes of the people who are on stage. And that's what I want you to focus on as we do this. I don't, the scenario is the same for everyone. But as it changes over time, and I give you a little more information, I kind of leak that as it goes, I'm going to ask them to be able to sort of sit through and think about who they are. All right? So I'm going to refer to everyone by first name, with no disrespect, obviously. But the idea is that we have uh, a person who is going to act as our head of school, our first year head of school, which is Ed, who's over there. We have our primary funder, who is Eli, who is over here. We have a parent, who is in the middle, who is Sarah, over here. And we have a fantastic student, who is Abby, who is over here. And we have uh, a representative of Prisma, who is both a weaver and also helps to guide people in, the, in other ways, who's Deborah, who's over here. So when I talk about them and I go back and forth, I understand that they have, in some ways, somewhat different ways of thinking about it. So the scenario is like this. You have a school that's outside of one of the large metro areas, right? It's one of those places which has a large Jewish community that has you know, promise and it's wonderful. And the community day school that's there has, in its first year head of school, has been talking to some of the staff about some of the things they might do in order to change the school and move it in a certain direction. And one of the comments that they said was perhaps what they're going to do is take their four time a week Hebrew and three time a week Tanakh class and combine it and turn it into a Jewish identity class. With the idea being that with both Hebrew and with Chumash and Tanakh, that it would be something that would really focus on the idea of how that would make a Jew into a complete person. So first we're going to start with our mother over here, who has a child who perhaps that might have some issues. Now, if you were going to call the fantastic head of school here, Ed, and say a couple of things, what might you say to him? I have a dyslexic daughter. In what way are you going to support my child? She can't take on two languages. And I want the truth. I want to know whether we've got ESS, whether we've got support for her. Why are you taking away something she truly loved? Because my daughter is a Yiddish Shama, and you're going to take away something that's very important to her. So I don't know how you feel, but I'll, I'll let you speak. 
So Ed, what would you respond when you're in that situation? I think first, the first. Oh, you can't hear us? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Technology. <laughs> Since we want Sarah to repeat. Could, could, you, could you just outline two or three of the main points that were hateful that you said to him? It was really nice. Oh, no problem. <laughs> we don't know each other at all. Yeah. Um, anyway, so my point is that I have a daughter who's dyslexic. And she has real issues with learning two languages. Quite difficult for her. And she's achieved a tremendous amount. She has a Hebrew tutor. She has an English tutor. She has a math tutor. Tremendous support on our, on our end. But what can you do for us? Because you're going to switch this program in which she thrives. She feels good about herself. And you're going to make her feel incompetent. So what can you do to, to resolve this issue? Take a crack at that? Yeah, take a crack. Okay. So uh, first of all, I'm really, I'm really so happy that you called. Uh, because um, uh, one, one big takeaway I think I have to consider right now about the, the, the fact on the staff is how, we, how we're socializing. And uh, we're very much in process of being able to, to um, design a program that's going to is intended to meet big mission and big values. Um, and, and some larger principles around the, the power of Jewish learning when Hebrew and, uh, and, 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 the te and Jewish texts are integrated and combined. Um, however, it's not without complexity. And so, um, so one of the things that perhaps I'd like to invite you to do is to come in. And I want to know as well, are there other parents who are sharing the same concerns? I imagine that there are. And we would anticipate that. And so uh, as we're going forward and, and thinking through the, the way that we might do this, uh, that the, one of the essential steps we have to take, and, um, and if I'm going to be reflective, we probably should have taken it earlier, was to, act, to really, it, it, it before uh, it, you know, bring this far advanced amongst our faculty, to be able to talk with Jewish parents and with their particular concerns. And one for you to be able to share you know, those concerns that may affect your children personally, but then also how, um, how we, our, our, our thinking up till now of how we how we would address it educationally, um, and in terms of what really is a concern and anxiety and something very positive, and also though to be able to learn more from you to enable us to uh, uh, to, to respond more effectively and positively to those concerns and be constructive. About. If your vision is to create very uh, uh, children who can speak Ivrit be Ivrit, which to some people might seem essential, to my child would be detrimental, please explain, I mean, uh, in what sense is Ivrit be Ivrit going to help my, my child grow as a Jew in America? It's very essential for my child and I understand there might be parents who might have different views, but what do you have in place right now? And who made these decisions without actually speaking to the parents? Because my child is not incapable. Dyslexia, please go read Malcolm Gladwell, because I think it's time for you to do that. David and Goliath, phenomenal. My daughter is not stupid. My daughter is very smart. And she is not being treated as intelligent. So what are, you, what are your plans to treat my daughter with respect? Because she is an individual and somebody we want to help develop, not to debase and not to embarrass, but to make her love her Yiddishkeit. And you are going to make that happen, I hope. Because otherwise, we've lost a child. It doesn't matter how many parents you have involved. My child is important. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, and I would expect you to be able to advocate for your child. And uh, but uh, the all this, the concerns that you have regarding your child are my concerns and the faculty's concerns too. Why do you need too. to have all these parents involved? Isn't my child important as well, an individual? Give him a chance. <laughs> so you asked me to do this. I, I, I love your enthusiasm. But give him a chance. No. <laughs> So they may not be, and I'll say this, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to respond to all those concerns standing on one foot, okay. because they're significant ones. And nor am I going to seek to do that alone. 
Um, and my offer, if you'd like to come in and speak specifically about your child, as opposed to um, um, uh, speaking for the entire community, then we certainly can. And, no, we certainly can and should handle it that way. Then, um, but uh, but as opposed to sitting now on the on the telephone and trying to have is really a complex and um, and a, a you know and a very important conversation. That's not the way I do work, let alone serious educational work. Nor with the team that I work with handled that way. So um, we really need to make a time for you to come in. And I'd like to understand better, but more important than me, um, I being the head of school, you know, relying upon a superb educational team who, um, who are in the process of thinking this through. So by being able to address your questions, is not, it, 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 you know, it, it is, it's not merely a matter. I want you to know my agenda is not to pacify you, right? Or to um, simply um, try and negotiate those concerns. By you expressing those concerns will ultimately impact and inform the final educational development of this product, which is still very much in process. So could you come in, please, and let's make a time to do that. And I'd like the team, actually, um, on, in content areas, in learning specialties, the whole team that we have together, to be able to encounter what you're talking about. So let's say at this point, just to make it a little more, you know, tense, um, Eli hears about this program, and he is extremely happy because he has a relative who was passed recently who he'd love to name the program after. And he'd really like to have Ivrit be Ivrit, and he would like to have that. And Eli, how would you express those concerns to Ed now, who has been beaten up before about this? So normally, um, you want me to have a mic? You can, you can take this one. Take that one, OK. So my philosophy in giving has always been to uh, keep my pocketbook open and my mouth shut when it comes to funding, especially this wonderful day school. But, um, you know, in talking to my wife, we thought it would really be nice if we had something that was named for my father, blessed memory, who just passed away. And he was really very, very much involved and, uh, and, and encouraged students to know Ivrit Bivrit. Uh, he went to Camp Moshe Vau when he was growing up, and he knew the name of every single, you know, bunkhouse and kitchen and everything in, in Hebrew. And he feels that kids don't do that anymore. So this is something that w resonated with him. And, um, you know, it's possible that some people might, you know, might not be in favor of it. But if you did implement such a program, I would fund it. So Ed, how do you feel about that phone call? That sounds like a pretty, uh, pretty impressive phone call. So could we, um, instead of discussing this on the telephone, could we actually make a meeting? <laughs> um, that, that, You're going to have a lot of meetings. Well, I, so um, welcome to my world. Um, and any head of school out here will tell you that, that is very much, um, and, and not, not only is it, um, is, it, is it what usually happens, it's actually when good things happen. Mm. It means we're sitting down and being deliberative mm -hmm. and, uh, and reflecting upon it. Um, and, and, and engaging all stakeholders. So, of course, I'm thrilled that you want to be able to make that kind of investment. And, um, and when we would talk about it. I'll share with you um, the, the work that our faculty and staff are doing now, um, the opportunities that we see with it, but also some of the challenges around it, too. Because in order to do this right, right um, and I was speaking to a, a parent earlier who had deep <laughs> concerns about this. No, to be able to do this right is going to take a significant investment of, you know, first and foremost on our part, of creativity and hard work and, um, and being also able to reach out um, and, and to, to see how are other schools uh, who have considered this, who has done it successfully and who has not. But at the end of the day, it will require um, those, the investment of hard work and time, but also investment of capital. And I can't tell you how much it means to me that, you're, you, know, that you believe in this and would want to work with us to develop the right kind of program. Fantastic. So let's say after all these phone calls, you wanted some, maybe some advice from someone who might have a larger view um, from working with a whole bunch of schools. So if you called yes. Deborah, what kind of question would you ask her about this? Well, first of all, I'm calling Deborah and saying, so Deborah, the, um, uh, being an expert at having made mistakes as head of school over having done this a long time, that's <laughs> one expertise I have is making mistakes and being uh, as a head. And, um, and, and the, you know, the mistake I, I'm looking at right now, that I, at least one that I made here, um, was, uh, not, uh, w w was, was uh, starting to socialize this. Um, amongst our school school community, without you know doing a pukhazi in the town, right? We, we didn't go we didn't go out and see um, and talk to um, 
who are, who are, where are the schools that have done this with great success, or at least that we understand with great success, and what are the schools that have um, worked in this model um, with a lack of success? Um, I should have called Mitch Malkus, so I know he's in the room, because <laughs> Mitch did this, now as I understood, with incredible success in Los Angeles, and I'm still trying to, to uh, it, 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 work to, to be able to find that. Um, and I, sh I should have called Mitch, but, but Deborah, uh, you know, given the role you play, um, who should I be speaking to? Um, and uh, in the school world, but perhaps on, the, on a broader uh, uh, landscape, uh, to um, be able to uh, draw on some important data and perspective and feedback on making a, 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 a pedagogical and a curricular shift like this. So first things first, Ed, you are quite a first year ahead of school. <laughs> <laughs> The kinds of questions that you're asking often take heads many years of experience to get to. So um, first and foremost, I want to celebrate that. I want to identify that you're, you've reached out to me in your first year as a member of Prisma's Head of School Professional Excellence Program. You know um, what's at, thank you, thank you. Uh, you know, um, where to turn, right, when these things come up. So in addition to giving you a list of names of schools, I, I want to just check in on a couple of things. I want to check in on where your team is on this, right? Do not only, I know that you have a support network, I want to check in on their support network. Um, so thinking about Ivrit be Ivrit, I want to connect you to Niti Vota Torah, in Toronto, I want to connect you to, I'm not sure if you've heard of a woman named Sharon Freundel, who has rolled something like this out at Milton Gottesman uh, Jewish Primary Day School. I want to, right? Being a first year head, I think I'm the smartest person in the room, so I have <laughs> not. So that's on the Ivri Pi Ivri, right? That's the, that first question out there. But if we're going to dig deeper, you're also changing your school culture, right? You're shifting to a co-teaching model which is a very different model. So I want to connect your um, educational leaders to some folks. Amanda is in the room from the Loria Academy, has a tremendous co-teaching model. Um, you've, got, uh, you've got folks at uh, Jewish Community Day School in Boston, right? Um, uh, Seattle, right? Um, has an exceptional training program around the co-teaching model. So that's also for your team. Um, if we dig a little deeper on this, though, you're also working on a, a different curricular model, right? You're now not just talking about Hebrew, you're also talking about identity. And you are rolling a big package all together. So I want to connect you with Yehuda Yeager, who's thought about this identity model. And I want to connect you with Ruvain Travis at Atlanta Jewish, right? I, I want to like, dig deep into that piece. In addition to that, you've got a major school culture shift on your hands. Um, I want you to talk to me about the, the plans that we can help to put in place, right? That we can come in and help your team build out that vision for shifting the school culture. Um, what kind of coaching will you and your team want as this unrolls? So I, I want to think through, there are many different levels here. Um, and at the end of the day, Prisma is here to make sure that your school succeeds. So my phone is always available to you. My virtual door is always open for you and your whole, you guys are Prisma members. I want to make sure that every one of your team members is connected through our Reshet community. Right, you guys are deeply connected in the network. So let's start there um, and let's prioritize. What's on fire, we'll start with the most immediate connections and then let's actually dig deeper so we can help with the culture change. So looking at this from that angle, a lot of adults have had a chance to weigh in on this, but Abby's a student. Abby's looking up at this particular thing and <laughs> Abby's a great student and maybe she has friends who aren't as great students. So. Abby, what would, you, what would you say to the adults in your world about this kind of shift? Well, that's exactly what I'm thinking about. Me and my friends, we all have very different levels of Hebrew um, and text basis. 
So for my friends who have a very academically rigorous schedule, I'm thinking, will they feel held back by being with some of these other students who maybe don't have the same Hebrew background or don't not the same text study um, basis? The other thing I'm thinking about is this is a Tanakh class, correct? So for example, my school, we spend the second half of our senior year in Israel. So will the Hebrew skills that I learn studying Tanakh specifically and these Jewish texts help me when I'm walking down the street of Tel Aviv? Or if I'm at the shuk and I want to buy something? Like, are these things that are being considered? So even with that, and in the, in the other part, just to push back him a little bit, how would this work with, in your mind if you had carte blanche to be able to pick whether or not they could do this or not do this? Hmm. Would you want the change, or would you want it to continue the way that it is? <laughs> um, well, I think it could be a really successful program if it's executed correctly. I see, in my mind, levels being created for students who have the higher level of Hebrew knowledge. Um, or you can do a mix of the two, and then a primarily English, but maybe just saying the text in Hebrew class. Um, and I think, I, I do think that students could really gain a lot out of this, especially if the topic is widened, as you said, to this Jewish identities topic. Well, first of all, I want to, the, the crisis apparently is going to affect a lot of meeting time for you, so that's fantastic. <laughs> um, and, and, uh, and I'm happy your school got a new coffee maker because that would really help also. Um, the most Did of, you suggest it was a crisis? No, I would not. I would, the, the, the is abs this, absolutely, this, this is unfortunately, absolutely this is business yeah. as usual, so this is, this, is not, this is not a crisis level thing. Crisis level things are life and death, things that are, you know, the school closing, not closing, those are crisis issues. Um, what I want to do is give a chance for everyone here to just, uh, to be able to just take one or two minutes and just talk about their role and what it is that they would, they, they would really have done in this situation, how to come to them at their desk. So, Ed, please start. Um, first year. You're a first year high <laughs> school. Uh, so, in my part. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, um, I'm, I'm, being, I'm being reminded. Um, uh, so, uh, Robert, would you uh, share the uh, question again? Just a, 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 if you could just take, take a minute, but just for a second, come out of your role for a second. What would, okay. And what would you have done in, in you I know, can you can please be you. Okay, no one else can do it better. <laughs> I won't sing. No, thank you. Go ahead. Um, and so, um, if, to, to, to address. If, if with, how it would have happened if you, you know, please. So, it, it, it is interesting when we discussed this on the, on the phone last week, I mean, I, I started uh, with, you know, critiquing. Um, I think, of, at least based on the uh, on the initial description that was written, you know, in our materials uh, about the variety of mistakes that this first year had made. And I remember making any number of them, and you know, what we we continue to in our in our careers. But um, and I addressed some of them here on the stage. But I think being able to, uh, you know, number one, ensure that as the head, that uh, it, it felt to me that that head had. Uh, had stepped out of being head of school and had um, had kidnapped the role of uh, head of Jewish studies, mm -hmm. and that's problematic on a variety of levels. Um, uh, that and and the, the the one that really you know seemed to to drive uh, the, the potential problem here and perhaps moved this too fast before having it socialized properly, before reaching out um, to other colleagues and other schools and and lever you know using every single resource that I have at my disposal. Um, in, in my own Rolodex, but all more importantly, being able to turn to you know, our national organization, um, and for that matter as well, to strategize um, with, 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 uh, with our key investor, uh, to talk to students and with parents. Um, I'm glad to say that um, we don't, I w wouldn't take any sort of major educational venture. And currently, you know, at, at our school, we've, in the past number of years, we've taken on a number of them. And, uh, and at least at this point uh, in my career, I was, you know, I, I and my team were wise enough to, to, to slow down in a few cases mm -hmm. and make sure that we brought every stakeholder in. And uh, in, in certain cases, then, then, then it all becomes very transparent of uh, what people are happy about, what they're not happy about, most of all where the hopes and fears are. And being able to manage those fears and, um, and think educationally, um, going in steps, um, to address them very directly. Um, and, uh, and to uh, and, and very honestly, being able to note, we're going to take this educational step because ultimately it is the best reflector of mission, vision, and values at our school. And therefore, there might be certain families for who that isn't going to work. Uh, but ultimately, to be able to determine that on on on, an, on that on, on a larger level of mission, vision, and values, 
and then also be certain that their majority of stakeholders are going to find uh, that new uh, academic development uh, really positive and, it, and, and one ultimately that can not only sustain but grow the school. All, you know, the Ruch, the Ruch and the Gosh Mute have to both be considered, you know, I think in context, but the, the administrative as well as the, the, the larger educational principles. Um, and, uh, and, and I think by engaging all the stakeholders, we're able to do that. Um, that seemed to be the mistake that I made as a first year head uh, that we wouldn't want to do here. So Eli, how would, how would you come out of character for a minute as a funder? Yeah. If you had a situation that, that started like that, how would, you, how would you turn that around? Good question. Mm. Uh, no, I mean, uh, 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 there's real, there really is a tension between uh, funders and administrators and people who run the institutions. The funders really like to think that they just write checks and nothing else. But, um, really? yes, <laughs> that's what they like to think. But, you know, they do get, first of all, they have, you know, their own pressures and what they particularly want. And then after a while, they start thinking that they, they might know a thing or two. And um, it's, it's very difficult um, to, to, to rein in um, those those thoughts that you have, especially if you're, you know, funding twenty percent, twenty five percent of a school. So, um, in this particular case, um, I think this was a positive development, uh, something that you could say that not necessarily that there was financial support for it, but some real some people some very important stakeholders in the school community um, are backing this particular move so it just doesn't have to come down to money but it could come down to support from significant stakeholders one who's maybe gone to the school their children have gone to the school and uh, in that way that could be a, uh, a help to you without saying and by the way you know if we implement this there's a six-figure check involved. <laughs> okay, so as a parent, I'd have to step out of this role. It's hard for me because I'm from New York, so I am pretty confrontational anyway. <laughs> but um, oh, and, uh, I think not being in New York anymore, I actually miss that. Don't you? <laughs> because I think that's very, what. Very degree, very direct. Uh, right. So I like authenticity. Also lives in Israel, so I like people to be totally <laughs> transparent and honest. And I'd want as a parent to know what really your goal was and where we really stood. And I've taught in many, many schools. There are schools that are very transparent about it and you can actually approach your principal, you can actually approach um, teachers and, they, and it's so child-centered that they want your child to achieve, to succeed. And then there are schools that I've taught in which are not child-centered at all. And, um, as a parent, I'd want to see that, is number one is respect those children, that you want each one of them to grow at the ability that they can. So, um, and as a teacher, I'd want to have as much support and not try to sweep it under the carpet. Well, don't worry, we're going to give you so-and-so, and your daughter's going to really grow even if she doesn't get her Hebrew. Um, I'd, I'd, I would not want that to be swept under the carpet. You'd be totally honest. There was one principal I worked for several years ago, and he really told a parent openly, your child is not going to succeed here. And I remember her sitting there crying with me. Mm. And he was right. The child really needed to go to a special school. It was not the right place for her. And sometimes that's very painful to do. Uh, the every be free thing is a totally different issue. <laughs> So the success of a program always depends on the attitudes of the students. So, and the one thing that students really want is their voices to be heard. Um, if students aren't, feel as if they had no part in this, it had no role in this, cre the creation of this program, then they're not gonna be into it and they're not gonna be um, wanting to participate and it'll ultimately fail after mm -hmm. pr probably the first year. So definitely taking into account um, the opinions of the students and also, like seeing, as you said, seeing the needs of the students um, within every aspect of this program. So um, I am thinking about uh, Ed's health, welfare, and longevity in his role. <laughs> uh, 
um, as a first year head of school, how is he thinking about this? Is the house on fire for him right now? And if so, how can we help to lower his temperature to um, gently coach him to understand that he has principles for the educational pieces of this, um, to help him to uh, connect with others in the field? Who, does Ed know that Ivrit Ivrit hasn't succeeded everywhere they've tried it? And in fact, has been a real tough moment in many, many schools. Is he so far down the path that he hasn't even considered that? Right? I, I want to unpack with Ed, where is he in this? And then, who are the best people to connect him with? Not to overwhelm him with a list of two dozen people, but who are the folks, um, who are the voices that will really help to inform his decisions going forward? And then, here's the key, make sure that I follow up with him. If I don't hear from him in a week, in two weeks, in three weeks, I'm doing a regular check-in to make sure that he's building the support systems with Prisma's um, partnership so that we can help his school and, and him as a, as a gifted leader to really succeed. First of all, I want to thank you guys. You guys are fantastic. Uh, I really... Really, in a lot of ways, what I wanted to do was, was I, I, I'm very blessed that I got to work with these people. I'm really very just happy that God put them in my life this way. But, and also to express very seriously that you guys come up here to take a risk. As everyone knows, he, you know, um, improv comes in threes. So I, I, appreciate, I appreciate everyone to be able to, uh, to be here and to be able to do this. And thank you guys very much and to be able to turn this over for a little analysis. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Oh. First of all, um, anyone who is interested in having Abby as a new head of school um, should be, uh, should be uh, yeah. come, come speak to me afterwards. Um, we had a pretty well manicured, calm conversation here. And I imagine it's calmer than some of us have actually had when large decisions are being made. I'm going to throw something else out there. There is one stakeholder population is not represented on this stage. And that's mm. the teachers mm -hmm. who, have to, who have to now implement something that maybe a head of school, maybe a funder wants to do, mm -hmm. loads of anxiety about it, about teaching in a second language. And so that anxiety and the talent pool that you have is also going to feature into the discussion. So what I'd love to find out from you is what worked for you about this and what would you have liked to seen, see in, in it? And, just if you, because we're creating a learning community here, if you can just say your first name and where you're from, that'd be helpful. You know what, I'm going to take a mic if you don't mind it. Thank you. Giving us the simulation so that we could have something to talk about. Um, I, I saw a lot of discussion about the what and the how and very little about the why. Um, Deborah got to it a little bit at the end, but no one, not the funder, not, no, no one asked, you know, what's the, is there an evidence base for this decision, and why are we doing it, and in what ways is it consistent with our mission, or any of the why questions. Okay. So that was missing for me. All right, so wanting to know why are you making this change, what's the significance of this change, and how that's going to have an impact on the various stakeholders. Yes. I'm going to give you a mic, and... And I am the um, head of school at Luria Academy of Brooklyn. Um, so one of the things I was just thinking about is that we often have meetings one-on-one -on -one with different stakeholders, but it's rare that we're sitting with all the stakeholders so they can hear each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about, in reflecting, were each individual person's, like, was how you were thinking about it actually impacted because you also heard a different perspective and thinking about what's possible around actually like bringing in different stakeholders to talk to each other or to be in dialogue with each other because we so rarely actually do that, right? I have so many different meetings with all of those different stakeholders, but they're never in the room together. Mm. Okay, so what would it look like if you really want to have a machlok at l'shem shamayim? You know, you've got to bring, you know, Shemayim is vast, right? The heavens are vast. You say, well, what would it mean to bring lots of different voices together so they can hear each other? Because they have different priorities. And how often 
Do we get people in the same room? Um, e Jewish Philanthropy recently published an article by Jonathan Cannon, mm -hmm. uh, formerly of uh, CSJDS, and now he's going to be head of school at uh, Ramaz in an interim position, who said, why don't we bring students into a conversation about day school affordability? Right? Never heard someone say that before. Mm -hmm. Then I knocked on Gil, Gil's door and said, hey, let's do that. Uh, and he said, yeah, that's a great idea. In other words, bridging this and saying it's not a full machloket in some way. It's not a full argument if you can't flesh out the argument and really understand the different positions of everyone in the room. Someone else? Yes, please. Hi, Leslie from Women's Institute of Torah Seminary in Baltimore. A lot of attention was paid to the fact that Ed was a first year in a head of school. And I'm wondering about the decision in the simulation to have him be a first year head of school and if there is maybe an implicit message that your first year isn't the time to make a big cultural change. Which again, it's always a challenge because when someone's hired, they're hired, they're hired usually whoever hired them wants to see results and there's mm. that tension in that first year between wanting to do nothing because mm. really that might be the best course of action mm. is your first year to do nothing make no changes just sit listen mm. and get some buy-in whereas there might be although other pressure that the head of school wants to prove him or herself or that maybe they're a fear of a contract not being renewed if there's some if there isn't some kind of they haven't achieved some result. And um, yeah, I guess I'm wondering, in creating the simulation, if there was a point of doing that, and if you think this whole simulation would play out differently if the head of school had been in that role for three, five, 10 years. Mm. Um, well, Ed, should I ask you? Yes. Um, would it play out differently? Entirely. Um, but um, I'll get you one. Or I can speak more loudly. <laughs> my students actually claim that I have a microphone and plant it in my <laughs> But I'll say my voice that way. Uh, the, the, um, the, 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 the question was, would it play out differently if, um, if, if the head of school wasn't the first year? And I was thinking back on myself and also a number of other colleagues who I've known and have worked with and um, when I've worked, served with them when they've been the first year as head, and then others who served with me when I, when I was the first year as head. And there is a tendency, um, I'm, I'm thinking back, to actually making some of the bigger mistakes earlier on because we, uh, w whether it's anything so strategic, we're excited, we have this leadership role, and there's an, we may see an opportunity to put forward some big program idea that, if we're going to be honest about it, reflects a specific educational agenda on our plate. And that's what I mentioned earlier. That's absolutely what a head of school shouldn't be doing. We, we, we suck up the, the oxygen in the room and in the school. We, um, we, uh, we marginalize the individuals who should take leadership in that. In this case, a head of Jewish studies in Hebrew. And, and, uh, and also, number three, don't ask the big questions. Um, and I, 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 I think I felt um, some significant discomfort because going back 20 years, I can think of a number of times <laughs> where I exactly did that early on, was um, coming forward with a very specific educational agenda, putting it forward as an idea as opposed to asking the larger educational questions and larger strategic questions around the school. And I know a number of colleagues who did the same thing. Um, unfortunately, some of us are here on the other end of it with some accumulated wisdom to talk about it, and some of us are not because, because we made mistakes like that. So, um, so today, uh, if there's anything I'm, I, I work to be conscious around, is not, is not uh, uh, taking a step like that, which is that, which is that specific and technical and agenda driven around a specific program. Okay, so being a first year sounds like it, it, it really did change the dynamic of this decision. Um, it's interesting because if you're looking at statistics right now, um, some of the research that I've seen recently is that a lot of heads of school stay only between two and four years. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, mm -hmm. we are actually having some research of the fallout of searches. The search process can often take 16 months for a school to fully recover and stabilize. So when you're looking at that level of instability, someone said they don't call it the Jewish day school movement for nothing. Um, <laughs> what happens to people who feel the urgency, <laughs> I've got to show my worth here, how do I do that effectively, versus the listening tour and trying to get to know the stakeholders differently, and what are the anxieties and tensions? 
Now, this was a relatively calm issue because it wasn't a crisis issue. Is that fair to say? That's fair. Uh, I imagine that some of you have been in that crisis place, um, and the emotions are different. Does anyone want to speak to that, of, of a situation where you handled where, without, without names, obviously, and dates, but giving us a sense of what stakeholder tensions did you have to try to stabilize? Yeah. Please introduce yourself, and we'll get you a mic. I'm thinking of a tension of a parent sharing that a certain ch a different child should not be in the school. They feel that um, that the child has a detrimental impact on other students, mm -hmm. and some teachers agree to such an idea, mm -hmm. and others feel that just need, the child needs more help. And that, that is a more tense, burning question when people are saying, but look, he did such and such, and you know that to be true. So the tension ends up being trying to gain that greater perspective of what are we here for? Is it, is it the appropriate decision to tell a student not to return? Are there ways to be able to speak to the parents and teachers who have these legitimate concerns in a way that, that can further the growth of that child so that we don't say that well, you don't fit in the box, you need to go elsewhere. Mm. So keeping students, and students who may not be conventionally successful, and students where there might be strong feelings about their, about their presence and the, and the way that they impact the dynamic in the classroom. Now Sarah, in this instance, could have actually done something that would have turned this into a crisis or a little, a bigger storm in a teacup. She could have said, if you don't do this, I am pulling my kid out. How many people in this room, by a show of hands, have had a variation of that conversation? Well, well, well. <laughs> um, and that's not easy. Um, Ellie could have said, if you don't do this, we're pulling out. Eli, sorry. Liked Eli. She liked Eli. Well, I want to honor your mother. Um, uh, may have actually said, this isn't working for us. I was going to give you this money, but only under these conditions, right? You could have had the Hebrew teacher say, I'm really losing my time now, and it was, or I potentially could lose my job, and there's a lot of anxiety here. So the way that this is currently conducted didn't get to a crisis level, but we could turn up the heat a little bit, and it would certainly get there. Um, in Leadership on the Line by Ron Hafetz and Marty Linsky, they have a chapter, for those of you who are dealing with this, Leadership on the Line is an outstanding book, um, and talking about technical leadership, adaptive leadership, but also orchestrating conflict. And one of their theses is, you better turn up the heat before you turn it down. Because you actually want to know what really are the undercurrents that are playing out that people may not feel as empowered as a New Yorker slash Israeli, very degree, comfortable, authentic, and they're hiding it, they're holding it in, but then there's that moment, and it's called registration forms. And they're basically saying, here's where I'm going to let you know that this wasn't working for me, that this decision didn't work. Or there's going to be parent or teacher quibbles. There's going to be people getting together and ganging up on someone, right? This is complicated. We know that the stakeholder community is complex and dynamic and does not naturally come together in the same room to discuss these things. Anything else? Yeah, please, introduce yourself. And we have, hold on a microphone somewhere. OK, thanks. I, w I was just going to remark that I think another thing that might turn up the heat and or complicate the scenario is in the world, they don't sit in separate chairs and aren't five different people. The head of school is also a parent. The donor is also a grandparent. Yeah. The student is also somebody's child. The donor's child is the one with the dyslexia, you know, uh, right. who's also, you know, the grand nephew of this one. We, and you're all sitting at each other's Shabbos tables or seeing each other in the kosher market. So it isn't neatly orchestrated. Yeah, so it's pretty messy. It's pretty messy. And a lot of people live in the communities in which they work,
and that adds a whole other layer of mess, right? Um, people, I know people who shop 25 miles away from the schools that they work in, um, that is literal, because they feel that they need to have some protected time and picking out vegetables should be their fun time um, <laughs> where they can do that in peace. So we actually want to raise the heat on some of the hostility, the potential hostilities here, and the potential threat of what happens if we don't handle it a certain way. Because these seem to be very nice people who are happy to negotiate with each other and hear each other's opinions more or less. But that's not really descriptive of every boardroom, of every classroom, or every living room and Shabbat table that we sit in. Anything else? Yeah, please. Introduce yourself. Okay, I'm Ray, I'm the director of the Day School Leadership Training Institute. Um, and so one of the things that really struck me as the scenario played out was the degree to which, whether they'd all been collectively around a table, as Amanda suggested, or individually, everything did come through the head of school. Mm -hmm. and, that is, and that is really a very real part of that. Mm -hmm. And so thinking about how we support the head of school in that position is an interesting one. Mm -hmm. And so one of my questions was, what could we have done to help a first year head to already have the network and the support to have not gotten quite into this fire situation? It's great that he was able to call Prisma, but, or that Prisma called him, but how did we get there beforehand? The, the other piece that, that we haven't explored at all was actually the real opportunity of the funder, mm -hmm. um, who, because having a funder for a potential initiative is an opportunity to ask, to really think of wh what could we really be doing that's more meaningful and how could the funding not just be for, you know, the co-teaching model, but for the professional development, for parent programs, mm -hmm. for many, many aspects. And so, so again, we very quickly go to how do we satisfy the donor mm. uh, and how in listening to that can we create a dialogue where we can also say, I'm so glad you're here because here's the opportunity that I'd like to explore with you. Right. Now, I, I did hear Ed do a little bit of that with, you know, we have to talk about some of the challenges of that perspective, um, but the idea that if we were to do this, what would be required of our school community? How could we make this happen? And I was actually thinking a lot while Ed was speaking how many decisions, perhaps a dozen decisions a day, might need to be handled like this, right? And there are only so many hours in the day. So uh, unless we all buy a different watch and uh, time functions differently, there's a resource question that's important to be asked in this as well. So I want to invite you, um, as we sit over supper, we're not inviting anyone to have indigestion, right? To talk about, to quetch about the machloket. But our conversation and our framing is really to create an environment where we take the machloket and say, how do we create a machloket l'shem shamayim out of this? Is there a way that we can authentically, we could create a platform where we authentically invite voices and, and hear people in a different way? Is there a way where we tone down the crisis by heating up the crisis, hearing more of it, inviting that to the table, and then tempering it in some way? Um, through, a variety of, uh, through a variety of methods, what are the ways in which we might approach a situation like this, or situations that we're currently in, where we take out some of the emotion and the personalization and the ego, and we really get down to what Susan spoke about before, the why of what we're doing this, and how we build buy-in for the why. So I'll invite you to, um, to continue this conversation in the important ways uh, that we can reframe it as people who are in this sacred community of chinuch, of education. Thank you.